Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. A group of Iranians stormed the U.S. Embassy on November 4th, 1979 and took many Americans hostage. Two months earlier, a fancy new sports network would launch its quest to take hostage the eyeballs of sports fans across the world. The Iranian hostage crisis lasted for 444 days, which must have felt like an eternity for these hostages. However, this fancy new sports network took the sports world hostage back in 1979 and never looked back. And without these four little letters, we may have never been able to watch the NFL Draft. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast, where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. Great Scott. This time as we step off our DeLorean, the date is September 7th, 1979, and it is 7 p.m. Eastern. This is the day and time that those four little letters come into existence. This is when ESPN officially launches. And it's going to take the sports world hostage, and it's going to never look back. I mean, ESPN plays a large role in many sports. However, ESPN at the dawn of its creation just definitely played a major role in the NFL. And shortly after the ESPN network was launched, then-president Chet Simmons would approach Pete Rozelle. He would come up with this crazy idea. His idea was, let's televise the draft. Televise the draft? I mean, to you and me, it seems like a good idea because, well, we know what the results were. But back then, Pete Rizal, he's all like, why is that a good idea? That doesn't make any sense. I don't really think a whole bunch of, you know, people around the world are going to want to watch uh, some old dudes trying to argue over some rookies and who's going to pick them. And, you know, just like the whole, it's not going to be live action, just players being picked, just like bingo, Friday nights, Saturday nights. I don't know when, when do they, when do they play bingo? I don't know. And Chris Berman had a quote, too. He was there. He was helping near the beginning of it. You know, the old ESPN launch and the NFL draft and everything. And he had a quote that kind of explained what he thought about it, too. And when is such. When we first put it on, people were saying, are you kidding me? It's like reading the phone book, which in the early years it was. Back in 1980, 81, 82, we didn't have satellite dishes and uplinks everywhere so that we were live 12 places and the ability to interview guys on the phone. We had to bring our books. But that did not stop ESPN from launching what would end up becoming a very fruitful and successful adventure. This is going to also advance the fan engagement for years to come. I mean, just think about what it was last week in Nashville. They had the record. It was like over 150,000 supposed fans that were there for round one, day one, watching the NFL draft. Sure, it was up and down that little area. You got a bunch of bars and honky-tonks, but there were people, crazy fans throughout the streets. And although there were many other reasons why they might have been there, it all boiled down to this. Watching players go from college into the pros. That's it. Yeah, sure, you had a bunch of hoopla going on, and there were concerts, and they were interviewing famous people. I mean, they had the uh, the Tim McGraw concert and that kind of thing, and they interviewed the guys. I mean, there was Taylor Swift had a own music video or something coming out that night, and Luke Bryan was interviewed, and all sorts of other country stars, but it was not like that back in the day. Not when they first started the NFL Draft on TV, which was April 29th, 1980, at 10 a.m. Let's get this draft thing started. Wait a second. The morning? 10 a.m.? In the middle of the week? Uh, Yeah, that's not prime time. 
It was not because of pre-draft shows or anything like that. Sure, we have some draft shows nowadays that are starting at 10 in the morning. They're all around the clock, NFL Network. I mean, they're always talking about the draft leading up to it. Back then, though, no, it was not prime time. This was just something that we're going to try. So we get to the draft. We have the Mr. Lem Barney of Oklahoma. He's going to have the honor of being the first ever televised draft pick, and he's going to go to the Detroit Lions. I mean, how many of you remember that guy? He had the whole I'm flying like an airplane, you know, like a G6 over through the end zone every time he scored a touchdown. And I don't remember from personal experience, but I watched the videos. And I included a link to the NFL site that gives you the entire list of drafted players in the show notes. If you want to take a look at it, go ahead. And you can get there to the show notes through your podcast player or by heading to thefootballhistorydude.com. Also, I ask that you subscribe for free to the show by mashing that little subscribe button in your podcast player of choice. That way you get the hottest, freshest out the press episodes each and every week. And with Lem Barney going to the Detroit Lions first pick overall, it seemed like, you know, I'll tell you what, yeah, we know the future. We have the crystal ball that tells us this is going to be a success because they're going to finally be on primetime television. Three days of the NFL draft being televised on multiple sports channels and outlets and things. But back then, they didn't really think it was a total success. For instance, there was only one review that we could find. It was an article written in the Hartford Koran. But nonetheless, we know it's going to turn into a major event every year. That one review was written by Owen Canfield, and his article was titled NFL Draft Telecast, a neat experiment. Almost like, uh, you know, was this thing cool or not? Or, I mean, are you mocking me, bro? I'm I'm not sure what's going on here. I can just imagine him, you know, sipping his tea with his pinky in the air going, I do declare this was a neat experiment, but uh, not sure it's going to last a whole lot, just like this tea coming into my tummy. But, We all know it lasted. It would end up becoming a major event every year. However, back then, it wasn't quite as easy for them as it is today to do some of the film work. Now, I'm not saying today is easy by any means because they keep adding new things every year and they have to communicate and they have to kind of get with the cities and things like that because it's not always at Radio City anymore. But hey, back then it's a little bit different. Here's a quote from the article that was covering the draft explaining what they thought was kind of like new age technology craziness. I'm just not sure if this is going to work out kind of thing, and it went as such. The Detroit Lions hesitated for a show before drafting Billy Sims, and then they grabbed him. In a room not far down the hall from Rasmussen's dark paneled office, men were busy with scary-looking computer consoles that blinked and whirred and with hundreds of tape cassettes arranged alphabetically on racks. I mean, think about that. Not saying today is easy again, but back then, I mean, that's difficult. He mentioned how there were hundreds of tape cassettes arranged alphabetically on racks. Those tape racks? Those tapes are talking about the players coming in from college. Their highlight reels and so on and so forth and those kinds of things. It's not like today where, you know, we can mash a little button and boom, bam, it pops up and you got the highlights of latest. Let's just go with Hawkinson because I'm a Lions fan. You got these guys going out there, but let's see what he's got going on. So you and I have an idea, but we can't really understand it because we were not there at the dawn of this NFL draft being televised, where it was new technology at the time. It was a totally different kind of way of promoting what could be considered a mundane task of just selecting players, like they said, reading from a phone book. And I give credit to the very few producers and people that put this thing on. I mean, think about this. They're sitting there. Let's just call it pick seven or eight or something like that. And they're like, okay, I think I know what guy's going to go here, but I'm not 100% sure. Then boom, player gets taken. Start the clock. We got this thing a rolling because we got to find the highlight reel, the right one, because we've got all these listed out. We got these tapes in order and alphabetically and such. And I hope I put the right one in there. I hope I put the right tape. I hope I labeled it correctly and I got it in the right spot because boom, we got to put that thing in the tube, got to mash that button and we're going to set that out to the world. Not like in before, because this is live. This has to go out on time. And the former chairman of the board, ESPN chairman of the board at the time, Bill Rasmussen, he said this, We put 135 of those together preparing for this broadcast, and we built 195 still graphics. That's where you have players and maybe their stats and their names or something like that that's put up there. Again, 
Yeah, a little bit different than today with all the extra different kind of technology we have. So these guys were like pioneers, creating the foundation for what you and I now can see as the draft as such a big sports spectacle, even though it really is not the sport. It's all the allure of everything around it. And for us, being that it's normal, back then it was not. The article kind of gave us another clue glimpse of what they thought about it and how it was weird for them at the time. And it went as such. The last referred to a man at a keyboard tapping out the draftee's name and vital statistics, which come up on a screen and are then paired with the mugshot and filed in a computer, the push of a button away from instant retrieval. For us, it's like, yeah, uh, okay, that's uh, just going to pop up. I mean, think about it. We just see it as common. Player gets drafted, you know, the commissioner announces him. Of course, they come out, they boo him and all that stuff because they like to boo the commissioner all the time. And the player comes up, they get that little noise. You see him coming out of the green room. Then you have the stats up on the field. You got this highlight video going. Then it cuts back to Mel Kiper and the gang or just if depending on which one you're watching. And the instant analysis. I like this guy because of yada, yada, yada. And he fits in well with these guys. Or, man, they don't make any sense. Why would you pick him and they... Yak all back and forth about it for a while, and for us, again, just normal. Back then, not so the case. We even have the luxury of, you know, being, I'm using big time air quotes here, armchair quarterbacks, and we're experts before the draft comes up because we have all this instant access and information at our fingertips. We watch the draft or the games on our cell phones. We have social media, instant analysis, all these kinds of things, and they're common. Back then, it probably was pretty cool, though. It was revolutionary. It's like, hey, whoa, they picked a guy, and now I get to see what someone's reactions are live. That's awesome. Another thing that they thought was cool was they had, this is according to the article, they interviewed a cab driver after the Giants pick, and it went as such. Murdoch got his blonde image, voice, and opinion transported live to RCA SATCOM 1 satellite into some 4 million homes around the country from the Sheraton Ballroom. I mean. Yeah, okay, let's just talk to some guy on the street and that's just normal. Just the regular news, local news channel you have down the road, even if it's a little podunk town. You got some random dude just talking about what happened at my house blew up or something like that. I don't know. But back then, hey, that's pretty cool. But let's get to the building, the Sheraton Hotel, where they had this draft. The article stated that there were 10 cameras in the Sheraton and another at Rusty Staub's restaurant. I imagine that, you know, got to capture a little bit of live footage of these crazy raving fans and jumping up and down and cheering for their team or at the other thing, maybe at the other end of the spectrum, they're booing the pick. I mean, that happens nowadays, but the anticipation was building. There were announcers casing the joint. The doors did not open up until right before the draft started. Rasmussen said the NFL was smart, though. He said, the NFL did a smart thing. They passed out ballots to everybody waiting. People filled them out, and the one that comes closest to picking the first 28 draftees wins two tickets and an all-expenses-paid trip to the Super Bowl the next year. Talk about public relations. Again, nowadays, we would not have paper copies. We're just going to use the internet or the cell phones or that kind of thing to make our selections, and you can do it across the country. It's not just isolated here in the draft. But back then, it did keep those fans a little bit busy waiting to get into their room where they could watch the draft live, making it a little bit more worth the wait. They said that there was another small room set up for producers. It was basically five dudes producing away, and they got to get things ready for them. They have a woman on the phone calling players for interviews, the article said. ESPN Bob Lee, he announced, and he would get comments from Vince Papali. If that name sounds familiar, think about Mark Wahlberg. That guy came in and He was the one that Mark Wahlberg played for that movie, The Invincible. Upton Bell and Howard Balser from the Sporting News were giving some comments as well. George Grande was announcing too. Not sure the role of everybody, but they had all these guys. Not like they do nowadays, where it's basically, you know, hundreds of people. You got them backstage, outdoors. Got to make sure we get these little special sandwiches out for everybody so they can eat their snacks and such in between takes. But hey, it was... A little bit different back then. The article said that Papali and Grande, they didn't even get up to use the restroom for 12 hours. Think about that. That's a long time. And the draft is not as long as before, as far as the amount of picks and everything. Back then, the draft was 12 rounds with the 28 different teams. 
Now we have seven rounds for 32 teams, plus some compensatory picks, and you also got those bad boys that get their picks taken away for different reasons. Um, Just kind of off the cuff of my head, let's just talk about Spy Gate, Deflate Gate, Bounty Gate, oh, all those other kinds of gates. But even 1980, there were some guys that were doing some shady things, and they got some draft picks taken away from them. One team was the Raiders. They lost their fourth rounder because they had evasion of player limits. And the Eagles lost their third rounder for holding an illegal tryout. Now, though, the draft, we spread it out over three days. You know, speaking of last week, we had the first round on Thursday night starting at 8 p.m. Eastern. Rounds 2 and 3 are going to be Friday starting at 7 p.m. And then the 4th through 7th will be on Saturday starting at 12 p.m. And we're used to seeing Mel Kuyper and the boys announcing throughout the draft, giving us their opinions and such and all sorts of other things going on. But that wasn't what was going back then. It was just the beginning, the dawn. You have a glimpse of what's going to happen, but it wasn't quite the same as it is today. And that draft will conclude on the 30th with three players ultimately heading to the Hall of Fame. The first was Anthony Munoz of the Bengals, considered one of the greatest tackles of all time. Art Monk to the Redskins, another great wide receiver, one of the best of all time. And Dwight Stevenson to the Dolphins. I couldn't really confirm this though, but I saw that they randomly cut the feed out during the middle of the draft. Like, oh, time's up. Not a dedicated time for these guys. Let's kick them off the air and let's just keep letting them go and do their thing. But I wanted to ask if anyone is out there and you are watching it live, please send me a note. You know, go to the website, thefootballhistorydude.com, leave a message, put the contact page, whatever you got to do. I want to kind of hear about it because I have no idea. You can even go to the My Football Moment and you can set up your own little story about what happened in the draft. But then again, who could blame them? At the time, they didn't know how popular it was going to get. But with that being said, even though they didn't know for sure how big the draft on television was going to be in the future, Chris Berman offers a quote on how he felt there was growth opportunity, and it goes as such. And then the best part was when people started calling in sick to work on those Tuesdays. When the first guy called in and said, well, you know, don't tell anyone I called in sick. Well, maybe I'll be there after lunch. Then I knew we made it. So I have another favorite football moment for you. This one comes from Frank Bonacondri, and you can find him over at thefantasyfootballwire.com. His story revolves around the Packers and the Super Bowl, which for a long time, that's a team that was known to build basically only through the draft fitting in perfectly with this episode. Take it away, Frank. Football history, dude, what is up? This is Frank from the Fantasy Football Wire at the FFL Wire. I wanted to hit you up on the My Football Moment for sure. I love that you do this. I love listening to everybody's moments and stories. They they definitely are fun and enjoyable. So I can't wait for the uh, the final edit when you drop it. Let me know. I sent one to you a while back on one with my Ravens-Packers game. Uh, But for this one, a very memorable moment would have to be for me. The Packers Super Bowl, they win in Dallas, beat the Steelers. At the time, I was working um, as like a rep for, you know, like body shops and stuff. And I would be in the office in the mornings, and I used to hit the road and do my territory in the afternoon and then run that into like 5 p.m. at night. And I'd go, oh my God, I go to the UP in Wisconsin, you know, or in upper Michigan. I go up there, I go to Green Bay, Appleton, all over the valley, stuff like that, Milwaukee sometimes. But that day that they brought home the Lombardi, I heard it on the news and they were saying, yeah, they're going to be up at whatever, you know, at Lambeau Field, the, all the players and whatnot. And at the time I was like, man, I, sh- I got to get up and see that. But yeah, I, I mean, I want to take a company work truck and go see this thing. Yeah, right. So I do all my stuff in the office. I hit the road like mid morning and I'm listening to the radio and they, something came through that, you know, the players are arriving at Lambeau shortly and they're going to be at this entrance. And I'm like, Oh, this is too good. I should, I got, I can't miss this. Right. So I'm, I'm rolling in a company van decked out graphics with the name company, phone number, all this stuff. I'm like, man, I can't just roll up to, to Lambeau field in this thing and park somewhere. So I was like, if it times up right and I'm going through at the right time, I'll make it happen. So it, it worked out. I parked it in a couple neighborhoods, like way <laughs> across the street, which is pretty much now the Titletown district, I believe, but um, parked it way off on the street. 
It was freezing cold, snow, the weather sucked as usual. It's Wisconsin. It always sucks, you know, for six straight months. But walk from this neighborhood all the way down to the stadium. And I got up. I was able to see the bus arrive, the players get off, uh, the Lombardi Trophy, make an appearance, go through all the players' hands. I was in the crowd. It was electric. Um, being the, you know, the first Super Bowl since the, you know, the Patriots won. Uh, man, that place was going berserk. I've never heard like a parking lot be that loud. There was people wall to wall all over the place. Um, It was incredible. I was freezing. My hands were numb. I got, you know, some of it on my old phone and camera. So I got some, a little short video with it. I'll have to, maybe I'll dig that up and put it up sometime, but hope you enjoyed it. If I find the video, I'll try to post it, but who knows, man, it's on an old cell phone. Good luck trying to get that off of there. But yeah, electric moment. If anybody else was there, post up too on here on a, on a thread. Cause that was definitely a, an awesome, incredible Super Bowl moment. So thanks for listening to my story. Have a good day. I look forward to the uh, final cut of this pod. See ya. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of the football history dude. And we're able to gain some knowledge nuggets on something we just take for granted nowadays, having the NFL draft broadcast live into our eyeballs in various formats. If you have a favorite football draft moment, I would love to share it on the show. Please head to myfootballmoment.com and don't forget to subscribe for free to the show by mashing that little subscribe button on your podcast player of choice. And then you can get next week's episode, which we're going to stick with the theme of first events on television. This time that DeLorean we're going to take is putting on a few extra miles to head back to the time of the first televised game. But for now, dudes, I'm through if you're through. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. To make sure you're the first to get the next episode, please subscribe with your podcast player of choice and head on over to thefootballhistorydude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes, where we're going, we don't need roads. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories, and Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.